garrisoned at Fort McKinnon, and the British were attacking America in a war known as the War of 1812. And he noticed as the bombs were bursting in the air that he could see the glimpses of the American flag. And he wondered by morning if the flag would still be there. And through the smoke and haze in the morning, he could still see the American flag standing. And he took a pen and he wrote a poem that we all know and love today. And he wrote four verses to the song, The Star Spangled Banner. And I would like for us to stand and join our voices in singing the first and third verse. So let's stand and sing The Star Spangled Banner.
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin, and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you, not word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ is given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you of all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a great time to share the peace, and now with the modern way we've been doing it here lately, is just turn around and wave at your neighbors, wave in the back, wave towards your arms. Good morning. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us pray together.
mercy for your follower, you've given your only son that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into the hearts that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in the Holy Son. which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Eat, this is the body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. He gave it to all to drink. This is the cup of my new cup, and my blood shed for you, for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. Let's pray together now the words of our Savior Titus. together with your family after worship today, be sure to give to one another and not just take it separately. And make sure to say the words that the minister uses here in the church. As you give another, the bread say, the body of Christ given for you. Then as you give them the wine or the grape juice, say, the blood of Christ shed for you. This is done so that each person can be reassured and believe in Jesus Christ that loves them so much that he gave his very body unto his death on the cross. We can totally trust and believe that Christ will give this everlasting life and salvation he has promised to all believers. Now receive God's communion blessing. May the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of a godly life. You enabled us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. In 1886, the country of France gave to the United States a beautiful statue that was dedicated to the freedom and democracy that the United States represented. Just over a hundred years later, President Ronald Reagan instructed a group of repairmen to begin repairs on the Statue of Liberty. And it was given a new torch new paint job, new stairwell, among other things. Just a few years ago, more repairs were made to the Statue of Liberty. 2,000 years ago, God Almighty gave us a statue that we know as the cross. And the cross has never, to my knowledge, had any repairs done to it. And the cross stands forever. And this song that I'm going to sing makes a stark contrast between our temporary liberty in this country and our eternal liberty through the cross, the Statue of Liberty.
in tears. So if I start crying, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let's go with the first reading today. It's Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore you double. Our responsive reading is from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 14. For those of you who are reading this, you will read the part in full print. I will extol to you my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, they shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your grace. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and they shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Our second reading is from Romans 7, verses Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, 
and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Before I get started, could you please bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your Son, Jesus, who exclaims that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Jesus gives the promise to the worried, the hurried, the pressured, and the stressed out that there is rest and peace for our souls if we just come to him. Thank you, Lord, that you already know all of our concerns, and you care, and you listen. We're so grateful for your reminder that we don't have to carry everything on our own. And forgive us for the times we try to fix things by our own authority, for not taking the time or rest, for not coming to you first with our needs and burdens. And thank you for the inspiration that comes from your spirit, filling us with joy, covering us with protection, and leading us forward with hope, peace, and love. Please equip us to be your hands and feet, and be aware of those around us who may seem weary and burdened too. Help us to slow down and take the time to point others to you. May this message stir the hearts of your people. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, Hebrew Lutheran Church. It's good to be back at this service, and hello to those who are following along on Facebook. And many of you are probably wondering where I've been over the past month or so. Well, I was asked to put together an evening service at HLC, and I've been presiding and preaching at that, <coughs> that service. Um, <coughs> and uh, so I, uh, I'm so happy to be here again this morning. Uh, the service at night is basically a simple liturgical service. And if you do have the opportunity, come and visit us at, in the evening. It starts at 6 o'clock, and the ones who are there will be welcome to see you. The title of today's message is, Come to Me, which are the words we heard today in our Gospel reading taken from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. This passage is one of the most recognized and often repeated words of Jesus that you'll find in prayers, devotionals, books, sermons, funerals, just about any type of media that has been created. So what can be added further this morning to gain a better understanding of our faith? Well, that's what I hope to do by sharing some insights into this passage and help us to think and be prepared and act in these troubling times. <clears throat> so who is this message or this passage meant for? Do you know anyone who is facing serious health concerns? These words of Jesus are for them. Do you know anyone that is having financial difficulties? These words for Jesus are for them. Do you know anyone that's having mental health problems? These words of Jesus are for them. Do you know anyone that's in the middle of a marriage difficulty? These words of Jesus are for them. And do you know anyone who's worried about their children? These words for Jesus are for them. And do you know anyone who has been recently laid off because of COVID-19? These words of Jesus are for them. And do you know anyone that has an addiction problem? These words for Jesus are for them. And especially the person who thinks they have no problem at all. These words of Jesus are especially for them. And this message is for you and for me. But first, let's go back and review the Gospel of Matthew that has been revealed to us over the past several weeks. Jesus has been preparing his disciples to go out on their own to witness to the people around the cities and towns around the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus instructed them there is a cost of discipleship, and even their families would abandon them as they pursued the life of following the rabbi. And at this time, John the Baptist was placed in prison by Herod Antipas. But John heard about all the miracles and teachings of Jesus, and he wanted to make sure that Jesus was the Messiah. So he sent out his disciples to seek Jesus and ask him point blank if he was the one that they were waiting for. And Jesus answered them by saying this, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, 
and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. You see, Jesus had much admiration for John, and he, he even said that there is no other human being that's greater than John the Baptist, who was prophesied by the prophets in the Old Testament to be like the coming of Elijah. <clears throat> Jesus then goes on to have a stern message for three cities in that area, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, where Jesus had preached and performed miracles. <laughs> Yet these cities did not repent, and their futures were in grave danger of judgment because of their sinful lives and a lack of faith. And now this brings us to our gospel reading today, starting at Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. So let's break that down a little bit and see what God has in store for us to learn and understand this morning. First, Jesus makes this remarkable statement, starting at verse 25. And Jesus says this, And at that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your glorious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So what is Jesus saying? He's basically claiming that he is the epicenter of all revelation and all the hopes and promises of the Old Testament that are, that are being fulfilled in his coming. And as one theologian put it, in a dark world lit by candles and lamps, he comes as a searchlight. In his statement, we can glean five spiritual truths that are worth exploring here this morning. First, Jesus asserts that God the Father conceals and reveals according to his own goodwill. No one can grasp an understanding of God and foster a relationship with God by their own efforts. We cannot discern who Jesus is, what the kingdom is, unless God shows us. He conceals these things from those who are wise in their own pride and reveals them to those who come to them as a child in trust, as a child in trust and faith. Now this is basically opposite of human reasoning, and that's why so many elitists, the majority of academia, and most of those in the science community reject God. You see, when we listen to man and not God, we run the risk of defying the truth or never even recognize it, even though it's right in front of our faces. Secondly, Jesus claims to be the supreme representative of the Father. Jesus fully represents God, and he comes with God's claim to turn human hearts back to himself. See, Jesus came at the fullness of time to begin his mission, and that mission is now our mission to come to completion as we make disciples and go out into the world to share the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. God's mission is Jesus' mission, and Jesus' mission is our mission. Let's not forget that fact, and we have a part to play in God's plan for redemption. And third, the Father fully understands Jesus, not John the Baptist, not the disciples, not the religious leaders of the day, not even Mary, his mother. The mystery of Jesus as being fully man and fully God is incomprehensible on this side of heaven. Theologians have spent centuries seeking to reconcile Jesus' divine and human natures, but it's like trying to put a square peg into a round hole. It just doesn't seem to fit. With a limited understanding of the human mind, it cannot be done. It takes God to know God. Only the Father knows the Son, and that's an astounding claim. And fourth, only Jesus fully understands and knows the Father. Many well-intended Bible teachers, preachers, and theologians have discovered and taught many true and virtuous things about God. But nobody has known God with the intimacy of Jesus who could call him Abba when reaching out to him in prayer. Jesus knows God the Father completely and absolutely. It staggers the mind when reflecting on the relationship of the Godhead because our finite minds can't fully grasp what true love is and how utterly beautiful is their relationship. It is simply mind-boggling. And fifth, because Jesus shares the Father's nature as well as ours, it's he and he alone who can reveal the Father. The issue of Christianity's claim of exclusivity to God is a stumbling block to many, but that doesn't mean that it's not the truth. Even Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? But before Pilate asked Jesus that question, 
Listen closely to what Jesus said that prompted that question in the first place, which is found in John chapter 18, verse 37. And Jesus makes this point. You say that I am king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who hears of the truth listens to my voice. In other words, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. That is exclusive. Without having any animosity towards other religions, this is not my claim. It's what Jesus said, which we believe because we hold dear to his voice and read and study the scriptures that's all about Jesus. To know God is to know Jesus. Pilate didn't know the truth because he didn't believe or have faith in Christ, so he could never know the Father in heaven. There's no other religion, no other person who could bring anyone to God. Jesus is the only way, contrary to what many in the counter church culture want you to believe. Yes, Jesus is exclusive, and yes, Jesus is God, and yes, he is the only way to salvation, of which are his own words. And we need to pray for our brothers and sisters who have lost their way in understanding this basic biblical truth. And now we come to the heart of the passage of today's gospel lesson. And Jesus says these words that I'd like to repeat one more time. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Have you ever heard anything so eloquent? so loving, so compassionate, and so Jesus? There are no other words that could cut as deep into one's heart as his plea from Jesus in these verses. But in context, who is Jesus actually speaking to? Well, he's addressing the people of Israel who have been placed under the authoritative rule of the Roman Empire and also under the oppression of the heavy load of rules and regulations put on their shoulders by the religious authorities namely the scribes and Pharisees. I'd like to ask you this question. How would you like to maintain 613 laws and commands that have been placed on the children of Israel with the understanding that keeping all these laws were a requirement for eternal life? I don't know of anyone who could even keep the Ten Commandments of God's moral law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. You see, the requirements of keeping these laws placed an unreasonable burden on a person because it's impossible to keep them perfectly. That is the problem with the belief system that you must earn your way into heaven. The results will be painful uncertainty, unsurmountable fear, deep despair, and a gnawing anxiety for inadequate for attempting to carve your own path to salvation. You see, there's no, uh, there's no perfect person except for Jesus Christ alone. We can't attain perfection. Mm -hmm. I have a, just a little short story just to tell you. It's a sports analogy, so I hope you bear with me. If you're Kentucky fans, and this will probably be okay, because they do need to do this. Um, I played high school basketball, so this story resonates a lot with me. There was a high school coach that at the end of every practice, his 10 players had to line up at the free throw line and take 10 foul shots. And the goal was for them to make all 10, which means they had to, as a team, had to make 100 in a row. Unfortunately, in every practice, one or many of them missed those, those foul shots. And if they missed them, they had to go on wind sprints at the end of practice, which I remember doing that very well, and I hated that. There's nothing worse than running wind sprints. So one practice, the best shooter on the team asked the coach if he could substitute for all the other players and teammates and take all the foul shots. And the coach honored that request. So the player gets up to the foul line and starts shooting shot after shot. He hits 30, and 50, and 75. He gets to 90, 98, and then he sinks 99 in a row. Teammates are going crazy. Coach has a big smile on his face. The young shooter gets ready and lets go of that last shot. It looks pure and right on the target. But the ball hits the front of the rim, and it slowly bounces off onto the ground. 
Now the team looks at the coach thinking that 99 shots in a row would be good enough to forego those running those run sprints that evening. But the coach, who still had a smile on his face, told the young man he was proud that he took on the burden for his teammates. But he said to all the teammates, get in line, they got one sprints to run. You see, that pursuit of perfection is a lonely road filled with many curves, bumps, and wind sprints. And we need a substitute. But the only one that we seek who is absolutely perfect is that person of Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus made that comment come to me, it was Jesus' way of telling us that the long search for finding God has come to an end. Jesus has open, loving arms and invites each of us to embrace him so that he can lift the burdens off our aching backs and not place undue stress onto our existence. Now, he doesn't remove the toils of life, but he gives us peace and fulfillment by setting us free and being in a right standing before God. We only need to trust those simple words, come to me, and we can enjoy everlasting peace and joy that goes beyond our human understanding. Now, Jesus used the imagery of a yoke to illustrate the ability to give us freedom. Now, it's not a yoke in only the sense of an ordinary farm implement, but that of a Jewish rabbinical writing that the yoke represents the total obligation a person must take upon themselves to earn salvation. This yoke was placed on the people by Israel's religious establishment, amounting to nothing less than unwarranted legalism, a system that taught salvation was earned by the means of strict obedience to a set of rules and regulations. Jesus replaces this yoke and lifts the burdens from these people because he takes on their burdens that culminated on the cross when all the sin was defeated by Jesus' resurrection on that first Easter morning. So my brothers and sisters, what do we find ourselves in our, this important passage in Scripture today? You see, we are also weary and burdened. The ones whom Jesus chose to reveal to his Father we're also the people Jesus has described as being poor in spirit, meek, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And we are those who acknowledge our sinfulness and realize that it's a burden too heavy for us to bear, that this load will drag us down to eternity in hell if we attempt to bear it all on our own. And we are also the ones who Jesus promised, and this rest that he gives is a free gift of grace. The yoke Jesus asked us to take upon ourselves might be defined as the whole Christian life. Once we assume that yoke, God's commands are no longer a heavy burden that weighs us down and destroys us. Instead, they are expressions of God's will in which we delight, where we look for ways to express our thanks for God for blessing us with his grace. The crosses we are called to, on to bear on account of our loyalty to our Savior are faith-strengthening experiences. They help us to understand what Christ endured for us. We have our Lord's promise that he'll give us the strength to endure them and that he'll make them opportunities, not burdens, for future blessings. The more faithfully we follow Jesus, the easier his yoke and lighter his burden becomes. Now we just celebrated Independence Day and Evan, I'm happy that you did that song today, wherever you may be this morning. <laughs> um, because what you said in that song is much of what I'm going to say here today. See, we remember that that hard fought victory for our country on Independence Day in becoming the United States of America. In our most cherished document, the Declaration of Independence, we read these words We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness is a great concept derived by our founding fathers in being a citizen of the United States. But in reality, do they really give us true freedom? And the short answer is no. My friends, Jesus said these simple three words, Come to me. You see, the pursuit of Jesus is where we'll find true and lasting freedom. And when we do, we become citizens of this heavenly kingdom, which is eternal. I told the evening service last week, and I'll repeat it for all of you today, 
We need to be totally dependent on Jesus. You see, we are actually chained to Jesus Christ, which may seem like an oxymoron, but it is through total dependence on Jesus where we find true freedom, a freedom that will last forever. So yesterday we celebrated Independence Day, but today let's celebrate our total dependence on Jesus and answer his call to come to me. So, my brothers and sisters in Christ, happy Independence Day. Amen. Thank you, Ray. Well, let's stand uh, and join our voices in singing the familiar song, My Country Tis.
gentle God and Lord, you have invited us to come to you with the heavy burdens of this life, that we may find rest and peace in your mercy. Grant relief to those who struggle, supply to those in need, hope to those who fear, and peace to those who are anxious, that we may be delivered from all adversity and brought to everlasting life where we shall join the saints of old in your presence forevermore. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Our Savior who gives us rest, please command an end to the pandemic and for mercy on all who suffer physical, spiritual, and economic hardship because of it. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious God, our heavenly Father, your mercy attendance all days of our life. Be our strength and support amid the worrisome changes of this world. And at life's end, grant us your promised rest and the full joys of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. Thank you. 